uh, 70 years of military service between the two of you and your father. And both of your kids are in the military, right? Two of my kids. I two, have three. Okay. And so if they do 20 years, that's 100 years of military service in that two generations. And we are live with the Black Rifle Coffee podcast. I'm Logan Stark. I'm flanked by a couple of fellow Scandinavians. Um, and we're going to get into that in a minute here. And then also Mr. Baker Levitt. Not Scandinavian. Not Scandinavian or uh, Big Bald Baby, as we like to call him. Um, he has played a clown in skits in the past and a couple other things. Um, he goes way back, way, way back with us. So we're going to hopefully dive into some Denman family history today Likely. with Travis and Jericho. Welcome to the show, officially. Yeah. We are joined by the eldest brother Denman, Travis, former... Uh, Army Ranger, former Green Beret, contractor, Marsa constructor, all kinds of stuff I'm sure we'll get into. Sweet. I'm assuming based off of the conversation that we had not too long ago that you guys have dug back into your family history. Is this correct? A little bit, yeah. Yeah. My dad, at one point when we were still at home, he had legit gone to England and went to the archives there or something. I've not been, so I don't really know the particulars of it. But he, uh, we got our whole family tree back to like the 1400s, like all of that stuff. So That's so rad. Very, uh, very tuned up on the history of where we come from. Probably a little more accurate than 23 and me, I bet. Likely uh, so. Uh, I <laughs> or imagine it could be that, totally wrong. Yeah. We I imagine that he like, he, he went to like some like chamber in a castle. That's what I would like. I would that's like to I imagine also, like how this happened. That's what I envision also, but I don't have any idea. I, I remember this because I have a weird memory. I'll forget my ATM pen code, but I'll for I'll remember shit from when I was like 11. Remember this. We lived in Germany at the time. My dad was in the army, so we were stationed in Germany. <clears throat> and one summer, I remember I went back to the States for the summer to like hang out with one of my cousins and my aunt and uncle. And I don't remember where you went, but my parents were basically like, all right, cool. We're free of the kids. So they went to England. And my dad did all this research. I mean, this is like pre-smartphone, pre-Google. Yeah. Pre-internet, really. It was yeah. pre-internet. Fuck. Yeah. Yeah. So he actually went there and like went to like libraries and shit, <laughs> like a nerd. And uh, yeah, he found the burial site of the very first Denman. Whoa, really? Which is in, basically like in Nottinghamshire. Nottinghamshire. Northern so England. North, North Retford is where the, the family... In England comes from prior to that from Denmark, but the first Dane mans that came were uh, north of London a little ways. Yeah. And there's a, yeah, there's an estate. There's all kinds of shit there. Yeah. It's and really I, weird. I'm sure like some shithouse historians could go and research this, but the way we understand it is our family came from Denmark. They were the people who settled in Northern England as like Vikings. They, you know, their ancestors a couple generations prior came in and just like, you know, slayed monks and shit and took over. And then they kind of became civilized and became farmers and all that shit. And then they settled in England. Yeah. Slayed some monks, yeah. drank some mead. Yeah. Likely. Yeah. Very likely. Ate some preserved fish. It's disgusting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When, yeah. when was the, uh, the grave? I don't think that, was it marked as to what year that was? Do you know? I can't recall. I, I don't know. Yeah. It was like. 16s or some shit. Yeah, there's like yeah. crazy, like earlier than that, it's like yeah. 11s or 10s or some shit. <clears throat> Real old. Dude, what do you think they were like? How do you, how do you think like their life was? Like, what were they doing on a regular basis? Like, the from what's left there, my understanding, I've not been there, but uh, there's like a, an estate that was left to uh, whatever the, whatever the equivalent to the VA is in England. I'm not sure what it is, but uh, they donated like the Denman property and it became like a like a kind of like an old folks home for vets and it's still that way now to my understanding that yeah. uh like old retired dudes oh, that's awesome. that run out of family members yeah. like live out their 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 life there and uh pretty nice like my dad's got pictures in there like they have a big dining hall and like you know big giant wooden chair and all that shit it's like very stereotypical of the times but i intend to go there someday my son's stationed in England right now too, so I might be able to go over there and oh yeah, and uh, you know, Airbnb his house or something. I, I, I picture your father like the the movie National Treasure, 
like sneaking in and stealing the documents. <laughs> well, I, I've I, never I, seen that. So what? Dude, that kind like, of fell flat. I don't know, I've never seen it. You've never seen that movie? No. Nick Cage. Is that where he steals the? Yeah, Constitution. That's what you're about, right? Yeah, yeah. It's a great flick. Great flick. This is called dead air. <laughs> so is that's that's your fault. Excuse I'm sorry. Me. So <clears throat> your dad was in the military. Yes. You were in the military for how many years? 22. So Jericho was 20. Mm-hmm. Your dad was 22. So between dad was 26. 26. So we're looking at the 70 years of military service between the two of you and your father. And both of your kids are in the military, right? Two of my kids. I two, have three. Okay. And so if they do 20 years, that's 100 years of military service in that two generations. Yeah. That's pretty impressive. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of normal, isn't it? Like, no. No, it's not. No, 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 no it's not at no. all. But that's <laughs> no. fine. Whatever. Our um, grandpas both were in the Navy too. Yeah, both our grandfathers were in the Navy, World War Two. Jeez, talk about service. it's really cool to to trace back some some family family lineage and like Trevor's another one of these mm-hmm. guys. Like he can trace his his heritage. Uh, his great great grandfather served in the American Revolution, and he's got all of that teed up. It's it's pretty cool. Have you traced any of your history? I haven't been able to get past uh, before the, any 1800s. Oh, like, really? We actually have a guy, if you trace our family lineage, we have a Revolutionary War chaplain in our family tree. Interesting. Which is weird. Not what I would have guessed to come out of your bloodline. But I like yeah. to think that he was like a cool chaplain. Yeah. You know, he like, he still slayed dudes, yeah. but. He like, was a grunt before and then he went to chaplain school after. Yeah, like uh, like the guy, uh, the Mogadishu guy who was later the regimental chaplain. Uh Struker, Chaplain Struker. Struker. Yeah. He's probably like that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, it's pretty cool because uh, Jericho and I have been reviewing uh, this edit that for this video that we've been working on in this this series. And we're like taking a crack at a, a travel show, which I think the concept for is really rad that Jericho came up with, which is basically like you're in an area for 72 hours on Libo. And like, what can you get into? What do you want to get into as like, you know, our type of culture and community. And we kind of like had a rather enjoyable experience in LA. Um, and I think a lot of that stems from the fact like you guys are both uh, military brats. Like, what was that like for you? Because I didn't, my father didn't serve in the military and you guys were all over the country, your whole entire childhood and growing up. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <clears throat> it's funny. Like when I was a new guy in the army and we would go places, I would like, I kind of knew how to conduct myself as a traveler because, you know, me and Travis moved. We moved about it. The longest I spent somewhere was once I joined the army and was in Ranger Battalion and we were fenced. So like our dad- A thousand percent. Yeah. 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 Like I think the longest up until now I'm retired and stuff. And like the longest during my military career up to that point was Okinawa, Japan. That was the longest I had lived ever anywhere. I was there almost five years. And in my lifetime, that was- That was- well, I was in the army, so it was awesome. Oh, never. <laughs> you know, I was not a Marine. So, uh, but, you know, then in 03, I got stationed at Fort Bragg and I've been there for a long, long time before I went to, uh, to the beach. But, uh, you know, yeah, we moved all the time. And it's like my first deployment in the army, you know, training exercise was in Korea. So I had lived in Korea as a kid when my dad was stationed there. So it was like, oh, we're going to Korea. And I'm like, meh. You know, yeah, whatever. Yeah. You know, yeah. like, oh, what the fuck? You think you know, you know, all about it? Like, I mean, I live there. <laughs> you know? yeah. Like, oh, well, yeah. Can you, you know? can you, uh, cause like I feel sometimes we do this. I'm, I'm like, I assume everyone listening knows what's up. Can you like give everybody your entire career, like soup to nuts, tooth to tail, your entire career? Starting at like joining the army? Yeah. So I joined the army in Germany. I was uh, dependent. My dad was in the army, so we were stationed at the time. I graduated from high school in Germany from a DOD school. And uh, we came home. My dad was on leave, went to uh, my grandparents' house. I left my granddad's house to go to MEPS in Portland, Oregon. And then that was 1992. And uh, I went to OSIT at Fort Benning, Georgia, became an infantryman. Uh, Immediately went, I was on option 40, I guess they call it, and uh, went straight into RIP. Which now RASP went into RIP, made it through RIP, got assigned to uh, Alpha Company 375, spent four years there. Um, 
went to SF Selection in 1995, started the Q course in February of 96, um, graduated, shit, I can't remember what month, honestly, but I got to Fort Lewis right at the beginning of 97. And I did three and a half years at Fort Lewis in uh, 3rd Battalion, 1st Group on uh, ODA 182. And then I got levied to Okinawa and I went to Okinawa in 1999 and uh, stayed in Okinawa until 2003, November. Went to Fort Bragg, did my Q course time, my instructor time at the Q course. I taught out at phase two SUT. And then I went from there. The last year I was in SWIC, I went to uh, the 18 Alpha Committee, taught officers for a year. And then I went to Bravo 23 in uh, third group. And I stayed there until 2013. And then I went back to SWIC one more time. I worked as the NCOIC of Range 37 for eight months. And then uh, I retired in 2014. Yeah. It's a lot. Damn. Yeah, that is a lot. <laughs> How long were you in Ranger Bat? Four, Four years. years. My what, was your, what was that like for you? <laughs> I thought it was normal. I mean, yeah. that's just the way it was, you know. Um, our dad was a former ranger. He was a 275 guy back in the 80s. And uh, that kind of permeated our life, that that example of a man, I guess. Like, so it wasn't really foreign to me. So I just thought that's the way, you know, that's the way shit is. Yeah. You know, whatever. I mean, yeah. even to this day, like all the hard things that I did in my military career, like still a wrestling coach in, in high school was a guy named Brent Cossey. He was an army chaplain and his wrestling practices were legit, man. Like I've never been smoked like that. Not by any army dude ever that the chaplain crushed us. But your time in the Ranger Bat, you had some moments of heightened excitement and then kind of. Yeah, I I queued up. I queued up Baker about your career. And I said, like, your your time in Ranger Battalion could best be described with two words. Blue balls. Yeah. I mean, a thousand percent. I got there, uh, 90, 1992. And then in 93, obviously, uh, Black Hawk Down happened, right? Um, that was Bravo Company and third battalion was in, in that. While that whole gunfight was going down, um, I was an alpha company. We got spun up. So we did a full 18 hour sequence and flew, landed in Mogadishu the day after. And, uh, you know, we were there to continue mission. But obviously, there was a lot of attention on the on the uh, on that operation by then, and uh, we stayed there for I remember it was like two weeks or so. And uh, pretty much once they once they got Durant back, the Clintons killed it, and we were like, "Yeah, we're leaving," and we left. So I deployed to Mogadishu and uh, did some convoy escorts and stuff like that. We didn't really do any combat ops, really, and then uh, came home. Um, I was still a private then, went to ranger school right after that and, uh, got out of ranger school. And then right then 94, we started training up. We were going to invade Haiti. I don't know if anybody remembers that in the nope. mid nineties, we were going to do a little Haitian, Haitian vacation. And, uh, that kind of got messed up too. I was actually on a, on a plane taxiing down the runway on Hunter army airfield. And, uh, you know, I'm about to jump into combat. Like this is like what I've lived to do for a long time. And then the plane turned around and parked. You can hear the engine, you know, they shut down and it's like, what the hell is going on? You know, like, hey, they scratched it. It's not happening. I'm like, what the fuck, bro? Yeah. How do you like, just go 180? Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. We were yeah. about to like get it on and then it got turned off. But during both of these, you know, blue balls experiences, uh, I saw a bunch of SF dudes each time. Like I, th- we lived on the airfield in Mogadishu and uh, we stayed in the old or not old. It was actually an unfinished uh, terminal building it was just a concrete shell. We had a bunch of cots in it. There was fifth group dudes like running around doing basically whatever the fuck they wanted to do all the time, you know, going in and out of the gate and like civvies and Toyota trucks. And, uh, I was a private at the time, but definitely noticed like there's these dudes are moving around kind of at will. And then when the Haiti thing stopped, a bunch of third group dudes got on our plane that we just got off of. And it's like, where are they going? Like they're going to Haiti. Like how the fuck does that happen? We didn't, we didn't like secure it. Like what's going on? <laughs> And then, uh, at the time I had a, a typical Ranger opinion of an SF guy, you know, like, uh, you know, if you're in Ranger Battalion, pretty much the only SF guys back then you would see is if you went to a SWIC school or something like that, probably not the best example of, uh, of a team guy. And, uh, I was a Ranger, so I fucking hated everybody, but, uh, for 
Rick Lamb came and to my platoon and he was my platoon sergeant. He's a seventh group guy. He's a ranger legend, but uh, he somehow made it from SF back to ranger battalion to do platoon sergeant time. And uh, he, he's awesome, you know, and he, you know, he talked to me a little bit about SF and stuff. And then I eventually went to selection and became SF dude and still took me forever before I finally got into a, a real combat deployment, you know, um, I was stationed in Noki when 9-11 happened. Uh, we did two deployments to uh, the Philippines, you know, 2002. And then I got nuked with the SWIC, the SWIC levy. So I had to go be an instructor for three years. And uh, that was... You've mentioned SWIC, the, you've mentioned SWIC a few times. What is SWIC? Uh, the Special Warfare Center. It's a school okay. right, where all the schools, SF schools are for Bragg. So usually... I'd say three to five, six years in somewhere in there, team time, they'll, uh, they'll come back at you if you got to back to be an instructor. I kind of got lucky because I did three years at Fort Lewis and then I PCS overseas to Okinawa. And, uh, I did a, what do they call it? A cot or, a I did an extension in Okinawa to stay there longer. And, uh, because it's cheaper to keep her, I got to stay there for a little while longer. So I was there for almost five years before finally I actually got like, Hey, you got to leave, go back to SWIC. And, uh, originally I was going to Key West to be a dive instructor, but I was living on Okinawa and like the last thing I wanted to do was go live on a smaller Island. So I asked to go to Bragg instead. And I ended up out in, uh, SUT. And that's kind of a funny story too. Uh, Originally Slade, I was in second battalion already at SWIC, which is the special skills battalions, dive school, halo sniper and uh, Sephardic and stuff. And, uh, I was in that battalion doing in processing and uh, the Sergeant Major walked by literally. He's like, oh, the new guys, you know, kind of shakes hand. Where are you guys going? I was like, I'm going out to 37. And he's like, kind of looked at my uniform. was like, I don't think so, Ranger. We need, we need guys like you out at, uh, out at Camp McCall. And I was like, oh, I'm already going to, you know, going to sniper school. And he's like, eh, I don't think so. And uh, I ended up out of Camp McCall. Yeah. So the, <clears throat> I mean, he was right. Yeah. Right. Like the, the, the portion of the Q course that Travis taught was basically like the ranger school part yeah. of the Q course. So pretty much made for that job. Yeah. You know. So you're, you're basically doing, it sounds like you're doing, you're doing a bunch of teaching during the early days of the GWAT. Right. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, I taught, I taught small unit tactics, which is the first training portion of the SF Q Q course at the time. Honestly, I don't know what they're doing now, but uh, when I was there, the studs would go to selection first. That was a TDY and return to their unit. And then when they successfully were select, when they were selected, they would come back to Fort Bragg PCS move and they would go through the Q course, which about a year long to including language. And uh, the first training portion of that was small unit tactics. And that's where I worked. So, I mean, that had to be maddening. There's a war going on and you're teaching. Like, I mean, obviously I would imagine that guys in that position want to get over there, right? Yeah. Yeah. It was very frustrating. It was very, very frustrating uh, to be there, but it was also frustrating to fight the, you know, the chain of command because we need good instructors as mm-hmm. well. You know, you're trying to produce new Green Berets to go feed the force and they're sending you dudes that they don't want to go to combat with to replace the instructors that are going back to their teams. You know, it's like, oh, if they got super squared away dude on the team, like, Hey man, it's my swick time. Can you, can you protect me? Like, Oh, hell yeah. We're going to protect. We're going to keep you here. I'll send this, this dude instead. So guys that were coming there were less than, uh, not all, you know, there were some dudes that were kind of yeah. like, Hey man, it's my time. Cool. But, uh, it was, it was a challenging time. Moreover, uh, the demand for green berets at that time, like skyrocketed, you know, I think we called it the 750 ramp up. Like Normally, when I first got to the Q course, I taught a couple classes, everything was normal. And we put out about 350 students a year, 300 graduates a year, right, from the Q course. And uh, kind of overnight, they ramped that up to like 750. And we got nothing new, like no more cadre, no more plastic claymores, no more guns, no more buildings, nothing. We just got 400 more students. Just more bodies. You know, so we had to figure out how to deal with that. And, uh, it started off, we were doing, at phase two, we were doing roughly four classes a year. Classes were 35 days long out of phase two. And then we'd have a cycle break, get ready for the next class, train new instructors, run it again. Well, it went from four classes a year to basically nonstop. 
We broke the course down into different cycles. They were week long and you would, I would drop students off on Sunday and pick students up on Monday. And it was like that for almost two years. Damn. You know, it's the only time my wife ever complained about my, my army, like deployments or anything like that was when I was in SWIC. Mm. That was it. Yeah. <clears throat> it's two years of normal cycle. Three years. Three years. I, was, I was at phase two for two years. And that finally I told my Sergeant Major, I was like, Hey man, I need a break, dude. Like I have to, like my wife's going to leave me. Like I've been in Pineland for two years. Like I need to get out of it. Yeah. You know, I came to SWIC to kind of get a break from team life and I'm deployed to Pineland indefinitely. Right. You know? So uh, I had a square away Sergeant Major, Terry Peters sent me back to main post. And I worked at the 18 Alpha Committee, the MOS Committee. I worked on the field team there and I was basically the 18 Charlie on the field team for the uh, 18 Alpha course. Well, and what was your MOS at the time? At the time, I was an 18 Charlie. Okay. And that's a that's uh, engineer. In, in combat engineer? Okay. Mm-hmm. When did you finally get to get over there? 07 was my first deployment. I went back to a team in uh, 2006 and I got there. The company was already deployed to, uh, to Iraq. So I was rear D and, uh, and I did the rear D, rear D duties. And then the company got back, you know, they basically went on leave. I was just waiting around. And then when they got back from leave, we went on our, you know, on our train up and yearly cycle. And then my company, we deployed to Iraq every year. Really? Sometimes twice. Was all the training you had done up to that point, was it effective over there? I mean, did you, were the notes you studied for the test, the right notes, the test being, you know, common? Uh, Somewhat, you know, somewhat. Yes. A lot of the, my first deployment I was doing, uh, I worked with host nation forces, like uh, we were with the ICTF in Iraq, and uh, that was, you know, fib. that was doing SF guy stuff, you know, working with Indige and going to combat with Indige, and it was perfect and uh, exactly what we had been doing, you know, so, or we had been trained to do. Um, a little bit, you know, war changes things, you know, you learn things during conflict that you change immediately, and it, does, it, takes, it takes some time to filter back to the schoolhouse and what's going on, you know, like, uh, you know, it took Sephardic a long time to catch up to, you know, what was the current CQB model that we were experiencing in Iraq, you know, and some of the old hats didn't want to, like, they didn't want to let go of points of domination CQB and shit like that, you know, and you had to like, Hey man, we don't want to do this anymore because, you know, dude, you're getting shot doing that. <laughs> like, you know. Was it, was it everything you thought it was going to be like when you got there and you got in to do the job that you signed up for? Like, was it sometimes? It was sometimes, you know, it's uh, everybody makes a joke. You know, you want to make a cool war movie, make it like nine hours long. And then there's like four seconds of combat. <laughs> yeah. yeah. There's and, uh, there is, pretty realistic, you know, there's something about it. We kind of skipped over it and it's something I've never really talked to you about. And I'm interested in is there was that piece of the GWAT that was the Philippines. that was Asia and yeah. you did deploy to Operation Enduring Freedom. Yeah. In the first group. Yeah. To the that Philippines. Was, The very first Operation Enduring Freedom Philippines that we did, like we deployed from Okinawa and uh, went into uh, Mindanao and uh, it was awesome. Like that was textbook Green Beret shit, man. We built a fire base. Like I, no kidding, I was an engineer. So I had the freaking manual out that Sergeant Major Jones had written, you know, the Special Forces A camp manual. And you're like, "Uh." (laughs) like, I got to review this shit. I ain't done it in a minute, you know? And uh, like, yeah, we built a fire base on the jungle, dude. Like, it was, it was bitching. Was that, was there danger involved in in those types of deployments? Like, I mean, as a non military guy, when I think of deployments, I think of Afghanistan, Iraq, and anything else, it's like, well, were those dangerous? Well, it's funny that, like, I mean, we look back on everything, you know, with hindsight, it's 2020. So you look back on it and you're like, oh, you're going to the Philippines, like, whatever. But the very first trip, you know, we, we were on a Chinook flying into Mindanao, landing on an LZ, and we were under the impression that it was no shit. Like, yeah, we're infilling into, you know, bad guy territory. And uh, it was funny, like, me and my buddy Joe, we're, he's 18 Bravo on my team. Like, we landed, got off the bird, like, set up a perimeter, everything, just textbook, you know. Kind of the next day, like, as the sun, it was right as the sun was coming up. It was like, like, you're looking around, like, what the fuck, man? Like, we're on like a Filipino Marine Corps firebase. Like it was just an LZ, like on a Marine Corps base. And we're like, how did we not get the memo, dude? (laughs) How did we not get this memo? Like nobody. And I think looking back on it is like everybody wanted it to be so badly, you know, wanted it to be like, yeah, we're going to fucking war. 
And it just wasn't. Yeah. We kind of like, oh yeah, we just ignore that part. And like, yeah, we're going to fucking get down, you know? And, uh, but once we realized, you know, where we were and what we were doing and, uh, the rules of engagement were basically accepted, you know, it was like, we were there to help the Filipinos deal with their, their insurgent problem in, uh, the Southern Philippines. And, uh, you know, we did that. Um, my fire base, we, you know, we built a school outside the fire base perimeter and, uh, we had guys on our team out there teaching local kids. We kind of, they started up a little village outside of our perimeter basically because there were Filipino Marines and the SFA team there now. So the security posture was much better. So a lot of civilians started moving closer to the base. There was a little market like springing up and it was rad, dude. You know, that's pretty cool. It was cool. It wasn't what you would expect a war to be, but it was pretty cool. And there was on different islands, there was, you know, a heightened threat level, you know, depending if you were on Holo back then, it was, it was pretty nasty. There was gunfights and shit. And uh, just depending on where you were, we were on uh, Maluso, so it wasn't quite as bad, but there were still shitheads around out there, really? there, you know, I think they just avoided us. Did you run into Evan at all? Because yeah. it sounded like you guys went to the when, Q course around the same time, like 96, 97. I, I graduated think. in 96 hmm. and I got to group like January, February, 97. Like, what see, year did we invade Iraq? Was that 2003? Oh, yeah. three. Yeah, Evan was, I think Evan was a Green Beret. Then I think Evan went to the Q course in 2002. No, it was before O2. that. What's that? It was before that. Okay. Yeah. yeah but you, another, another touch you have on the company is, uh, or friends of the company, you were Mike Glover's. Phase yeah, two I was, instructor. I was Mike Glover's fade two. Oh, really? Yeah. 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 No do you remember him? Yeah. How yeah, did actually, you do? I do. I mean, he was young. But like, when he went through there, he was he was young. Plus, he was a tomb guard before. Yeah, which, which is was pretty rare. cool. Yeah. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Like you there's things like, you know, when guys wear their scary shirt, you notice what's on it, you know? And then you don't see many like tomb guards yeah. come through the Q course. It was like noted. He did a video know? a couple years ago uh on Instagram of him going through the drill with his rifle and mm-hmm. stuff. It's, Unfreaking believable. Yeah. yeah. And then later I was his team sergeant actually in, in B23 for a, for a brief moment. Our team sergeant at the time was killed in a motorcycle accident. And, uh, and, uh, Mike and I were on the same team and, uh, then I fell into that position. I was team sergeant for a little bit. And then, uh, I can't remember where he, where he went. He, he PCS somewhere. I can't remember if it was, uh, over to CAG or if he went at that time, he went to 10th group, I think. Mm. maybe the 10th to us. Uh, they were starting at the time they were starting another SIF company. So they asked for dudes to go over there and help them out. Yeah. What? Uh, so something probably a lot of people are, I, I know it's like interesting to me, the whole like evolution of the SIF and then the CRIF and then like, now it's gone, right? I think so. <laughs> I don't know a hundred percent, you know, but like, uh, what's the SIF and the CRIF? So like Travis will explain it better, but, my understanding is within every SF group prior to the formation of the unit of mm-hmm. Delta, they SF, each SF group had basically a direct action arm, a direct action company, guys who weren't there to exclusively do foreign internal defense. They were there okay. to do, you know, hostage Where, rescue this, and all this stuff. This. Yeah. Okay. Um, it was strictly, strictly a hostage rescue thing back then. Like, in the late seventies, early eighties, it was called uh, Blue Light Project. It was uh, basically a detail that a special forces group, tenth group, obviously they operate in Europe, first group in Asia, seventh group in South America. There was a company out of the out of that group that was detailed to be the hostage rescue element should a hostage crisis occur, right? And uh, after doing that for several rotations, they you know, they basically figured out that like, if you really want to be good at this, you have to like focus on it. It's not something that you can just do, you know, like it's, it's a pretty detailed, very rehearsed, like set of skills that you have to have to, uh, to be successful. So, um, kind of, I think at the same time they were developing the unit, like they stood up this, the SIF companies at the time were called the, the commanders in extremist force. And it was basically, they were in theater SF companies that were task organized as assault troops and they would respond to any hostage crisis that occurred in that theater. And, uh, you know, once a varsity team came, you might get relieved mm. in place and, uh, and they would carry out whatever needed to be done. And, uh, that lasted 
until I think right around 03, 04, and they were still SIF companies in in operation. And uh, if you remember that time in Iraq, like there were a lot of casualties occurring and a lot of, uh, you know, when they were doing that manhunting, Tier one guys took a lot of took a lot of casualties, and that's kind of when Ranger Battalion started to kind of morph into a different different kind of entity than it had been in the past, you know. And they started to do more like human targeting and stuff. And uh, because the SIF companies were already trained in these CQB skills specifically, they were they were asked to kind of help out, you know. So SIF companies started deploying into Iraq, you know, and uh, that brought out a whole nother set of unforeseen circumstances because if you have a SIF company in Asia and then they deploy to Iraq, well, now who's, who's covering down on the, the possibility of a hostage crisis in Asia. So they had to figure that all out. And, uh, same thing in 10th. And, uh, you know, that went on. I mean, I was in a SIF still in 2011 in Iraq, you know, and then when we closed Iraq, we moved to another location and acted as the, you know, the crisis reaction element for CENTCOM. And then I think Iraq started back up, but I had, I had retired by then. So not really sure what happened after. What year did you retire? 14. Okay. Yeah. yeah I left B23 in 2013. And then uh, I was only in SWIC for like nine months. Just what kind of went what was your favorite job in the, that you did in your time? Like, what did you, like, looking yeah, back now, like memories. What's your favorite band? You know what I mean? Yeah. Like your song. What are favorite, some of your favorite? Like, like, dude, I mean... For me personally, I really enjoyed being an instructor. Okay. You know, I That's cool. I like mentoring the next generation into, you know, being Green Berets. I mean, I still I still have contact with a lot of guys that are instructors and kind of like the guys who were my team guys, you know, they're now SAR majors or whatever. You know, I still have contact with them and I talk about things. My last my last real job, I guess, was uh, I worked as a as a training cell guy for uh, Marsoc down at Camp Lejeune and, you know, I, I trained Marine Raiders, man. You know, that's kind of what we did. Go to the range, you know, go to the field, like talk about what I did, how it applies to what they're doing now and, uh, help them. You know, there's a, there's a lot of desire and there's a lot of need for real experience. You know, when I was young, the closest real conflict we had to look to was like Panama and like, maybe Grenada. But even when I got to Ranger Battalion, there was like three dudes in the battalion that were like Grenada Raiders, you know, and we had, we had several Panama vets, but it's after those conflicts, like the combat experience filters out. I mean, it's fast. You know, even if you go to Fort Bragg now, like, you know, during my glory days, you go to Fort Bragg, every, every dude on Bragg has got a CIB. Like they've been in combat five times. Like, you know, now you go to Fort Bragg and it's not the same dude. There's SF guys that, have not deployed to combat. And so that experience filters out real quick and uh, team guys need that. Like soldiers need that. They need to know, no shit. What's what it's, what it's like on the ground. Yeah. I remember that's, that's not the answer I would expect. Like, no. which is it, but it's really cool to hear that because it's like, you know, as a civilian in society, you know, like our depiction of green berets and Rangers and scout snipers and all that stuff. Like, this you don't uh, the teaching component and the way you just explained it that, that's really rad like it shows yeah. that you truly cared and like that's that's awesome man and so <clears throat> Jericho you you joined right around the time you went to the Q course then yeah ish uh, right roughly uh no he was ninety seven yeah I joined he'd been in you just got to first group at Fort yeah. Lewis right I actually lived my dad had retired out of Fort Lewis mm-hmm. so I lived there and so. He was in first group and it's kind of a funny thing. (laughs) When I, so I went off to, you know, go to RIP, got assigned to second range battalion, came in. He was at first group. He's like an E6 at first group. And my platoon sergeant at the time had been, I think in your platoon or company, Jimmy Pippen. Pippen, yeah. So they knew each other. Mm -hmm. So like Pippen, like he was a stereotypical ranger. He fucking hated SF dudes. And like, (laughs) but he knew Travis, who's like the rangerest Green Beret on earth. So 
he would always give me shit. He's like, your brother fucking talking to you and going SF yet? You're just going to go to SF as soon as you get your tab and yeah. like, blah, blah, blah. And I was, I was like, no. And, uh, but because they knew each other, like Travis ODA would always come and like do shit with my platoon because this was also like the Clinton years, yeah. right? So like funding was not great. Yeah, like, lots, of, lots of road marching. Yeah, lots, lots of, road of marching, lots of alerts to a road march and uh, not a lot of shooting. <laughs> yeah, so, but Ranger Regiment got better funding and support than yeah, at that time SF than SF yeah. did. So we always were just like, we had great resources, like as far as ammo and training time and all that comparatively, right? It wasn't as good as it became. So Travis's ODA would always come and like come to our, like if we had a flat range, his team would come. And then like maybe, you know, in exchange or whatever, they would teach us a foreign weapons class or Travis would teach demo class or fuck whatever. Cause at that point we were still like the, the Ranger Regiment that just patrolled. We didn't get a lot of like super specialized yeah. shit. And uh, I remember one time my team leader was, he was a great team leader, but he was a motherfucker. Mm -hmm. Right. And like Travis came out and he's my brother. I'm not going to be like standing up parade rest. So I'm like, Hey, what's up? And he's like, my team leader's like, you better fucking call him Sergeant. And he was like, kind of serious. <laughs> and he was like a corporal. And Travis was like, you don't have to fucking do that. Shut the fuck up. And then the guy was like, oh shit. <laughs> Did y'all ever cross paths in your time? Beside from the story you just told. Yeah. 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 Um, and Bath, was that 10? 2010? Yeah, I was, at the time, I worked in the 75th Regimental Headquarters. I was just a staff dude. And I was there as the, our task forces uh, ops sergeant major. I was an E7 fucking ops sergeant major. That still irks me because I wasn't getting paid extra, you know? I was doing an E9's job, mm -hmm. it was an E7's bullshit. But that's kind of a funny, yeah, it's a funny story because at the time we both, you know, had army haircuts, fucking shaved faces. So we looked super fucking similar. And obviously if you're listening to us talk, we talk very much similar. And uh, we were both V7s. Mm -hmm. And I had, I had just pinned eight. I had just pinned eight. Okay. Maybe I was an E8? I think, I think so. I think so. I pinned E8 on that trip. Yeah. So like somewhere in that time. But uh, he was, you were the Siege of Soda of Illinois to our task force. Right. So we were. What does that mean? <laughs> what does that mean? So, that was a good uh, mm -hmm. alphabet soup there, wasn't it? Yeah. Oh, wow. Oh, I never heard one yeah. of those. Yeah. Siege of Sodaf is basically the special forces like super headquarters in theater. Like okay. so in Afghanistan, there's a Siege of Sodaf that's like in charge of all the teams. Okay. And then in Iraq, there's a Siege of Sodaf that's like in charge of all the teams. Okay. Right? And that's the special forces side of the house. Like uh, I guess what you call the white side, soft side. And then there's the task force side, which is like the not white side, soft guys doing their stuff. And uh they drew from a SIF, one of the SIF companies, they'd pull a guy like, hey, you need to go and sit in this jock so that you can like liaise with this element because we don't really know any of those dudes. So another funny story about that is like literally the third group that I just had no idea who I was, like the whole deployment, you know? Yeah. I lived on Vance on their base, like ate at their childhood, like all the stuff. And then literally I, I, we were going to the range or something. I went to the, the jock star major and was like, hey man, can I get a truck to load up all this shit, take the range. He's like, nah, why don't you get one of your own trucks? And I'm like, uh, what do you mean? <laughs> and he's like, yeah, get one of the fucking goddamn ranger trucks or whatever. And I was like, bro, I'm in third group, man. And he's like, what? And I'm like, dude, I'm on your fucking rolls, bro. <laughs> like, you know, yeah. I'm in your unit. And he's like, oh, <laughs> shit, here. And I got a truck, you know, went to the range. Because we, SF had a range. They didn't have a range on bat. You know? Yeah. So like, we hey, I'll just take all these rangers to the fucking range and we'll shoot, you know? The only thing we had on Bagram was our jock. We had no operational anything there. There were no shooters there. They were all at outstations and shit. But <clears throat> the thing that fucking I always think about on that trip is we looked the same and guys would come up to me like, you know, like staff officers would come up to me just in like a fever. like, eh, And they needed some kind of like siege of soda question answered. Like what he did because they thought I was him mm -hmm. and I wouldn't correct him. <laughs> I wouldn't be like, oh, you're looking for my brother. Mm -hmm. I would just pretend I didn't know what the fuck they were talking about <laughs> <laughs> for a long time, like longer than it was funny. Yeah. You know, <laughs> and they just thought I was such a month. Like, oh, yeah. I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. Man. I, I've never heard of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, that was that was a fun time, and it made it actually made mom happy knowing we we're in the same place we we're overseas, which is yeah, kind of dumb because we were together. So if one of us got killed, we probably both got killed. But, Likely, <laughs> yeah. I was bummed that whole trip because that's my only Afghanistan rotation I ever did was a staff dude. Like I was in third group, but I was in Bravo two three, so we were always in Iraq. You know, I never got to go. That was my only trip to Afghanistan, and the whole time I was trying to get. Merit to let me go on a freaking yeah. going an op with the Rangers, you know? And uh, he's like, okay, 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 okay. Hey, I'm leaving tomorrow. Oh, man. <laughs> like, shit. You know, and I'm like, fuck. And yeah. I never got to get out the gate, you know? Yeah. And I remember, I was there. I wasn't there the whole, like, I left early because they did some, like, reshuffling around of staffing and regiment. I had to leave early to go back to go to RASP or mm -hmm. some shit. I don't remember. But, yeah. So... SF versus Ranger responsibilities. What, what do you guys kind of, or, you know, what did you lean towards, like, kind of being more favorable experience, or was there one? No, they're just different, man. Yeah. I mean, it's just different. It's a different mission, different objective. Like, it's just different shit. Yeah. You know, it's just another skill set. And, uh, you know, there are dudes that exist in both. I think there's dudes that are more suited to either. And uh, some guys should probably stay where they're at. Yeah, when you it when you say some are more suited towards the other, what are those like personality traits that you kind yeah, of just, saw evolve just, over time? Maybe it's just guys like a certain a certain environment better than others. You know, there's guys that really like teach. I like teaching. You know, it's it uh, it's fulfilling. Yeah, yeah. It's, it makes me happy. I get a warm and fuzzy when I see the light bulbs go off and some other yeah, like, sure. young guy, or whatever, he figures some shit out. You know, and uh, that's rewarding to me. There's a lot of, uh, I mean, I laughed when, when I found out that they had Rangers doing attempted FID in, in, uh, Afghanistan, like, Hey, we're training up these Afghans. And like, that's what's being said. But from my green beret eyes, I'm looking at a bunch of Rangers like, Hey, sit the fuck down and don't talk to anybody. And I was like, okay. I'm like, <laughs> Hey man, you guys aren't really teaching them dudes a lot. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Maybe. And that's, like I said, that's from my point of view, you know, as a, as an SF guy, but, uh, I don't think Rangers are the best suited FID force, you know, probably not. Yeah. If you want to do a raid, you probably should call them. Yeah, you sure. Yeah. yeah. But also, do you think that has, Rangers, generally speaking, are much younger than SF guys, right? Uh, at one time, that was true. And I don't think that's accurate anymore. Really? I think it's about the same now because it's balanced out. Somewhere around, I think, 2003, 04, they started taking SF uh, 18 x-rays. They started allowing uh, guys to come in off the street as an SF dude. And uh, they go through the pipeline. When I went to SF, you had to be an NCO to apply, right? So like the youngest, when I got to my team, I was 24, 25, something like that. And I was the youngest guy by a fucking long shot, like a long ways, you know? We had a Vietnam vet on my team. Oh, yeah. really? Yeah. Wow. Oh, wow. Um, comparing the two, like getting into Ranger Regiment, Ranger Battalion versus getting into an SF team, like challenging, like was one harder than the other? I don't think so. I think they were about the same. I mean, it was physically shitty. You know, it sucked. Uh, I think the Ranger instructor, when I went to RIP, you know, in 1992, it was a little bit maybe more abrasive than... Uh, <laughs> Than uh, the Q course, but RIP was also four weeks, and yeah. the Q course is six months. You know, so it's a different it's right. a different existence. You know, there's periods of the Q course that are very physically demanding. There's other times where you're going to class all day, every day. What was the hardest part of RIP for you? In the moment, not looking back, but in the moment, what was the most challenging component uh, the of the cold? Effort? The cold. Yeah, yeah. I went to RIP in like uh, I think it was December, November, December, and uh, we were obviously at cold range the whole time. And it was fucking cold, man. Really? Like it, yeah. just, it hurt. What, what was the hardest part of the Q course for you? Most challenging. <laughs> the only thing I was really no shit worried about, like was language school, man. Like, really? Because at the time they're like, hey, if you don't learn how to speak a language, you're fucked. And you're like, a you're Thai gonna, guy, right? Huh? You're a Thai guy, right? I speak Thai, yeah. And uh, they're like, if you don't speak language, you're, gonna, you're fucking out, you know? And I'm like, dude, that's, I mean, that's not a small thing. You know what I'm saying? Like, can't like get a retest or something, you know? Right, yeah. But I was really worried about it. I don't really remember being worried about any of the tactical shit or any of that. Like, but like, there's a lot of book, there's a lot of book learning to do in really? the Q course, you know, in the engineer course, you know, we had demo, we had bridging, we had all these wacko fucking math formulas that we had to learn, you know? So the book stuff was more, I guess, scary to me than any of the physical 
shit. And like I said, I had been, you know, I was on Chaplin Kazi's wrestling team. So <laughs> yeah. the physical shit wasn't really a worry. It was yeah. more of the mental aspect of it. Am I going to fail this test? You know, like, fuck man, what am I going to do now? Yeah. It's, you know? So the, for you two guys, like when we lived in Germany, our school was an American, it was an American high school, you know, in Germany. So the, it went grades seven through 12. So I was in the seventh grade when Travis was a senior. Mm-hmm. So we got to be on the same wrestling team mm. like one year, which was really cool. <laughs> but I, I think back to that now and I'm like, God, that guy was a psychopath. Like all I remember- way. Like all the way. I remember Travis, like we had this little wrestling room about the size of this room. He would turn the radio, those old school radiators. Oh, yeah. He would just turn them up full blast. We were required to wear like thermal underwear and a sweatsuit, put the hood on and tie it. And he would just smoke our bags for two hours. I remember in one practice, Travis passed out. Like <laughs> he was a fucking heat casualty. Like no yeah. shit. Chaplin Kazi grabbed him by the ankle, dragged him out of the wrestling room and just put him out like the wrestling room. You'd leave it and you'd go out into like the big basketball court of the regular gym at the high school. Yeah. And he just dragged him out there, dropped his foot and then came back in. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't check on him. Wasn't like, oh, fuck, this could be bad. I should get some cold water on him. He just drug him out of the room and then came back in for practice. <laughs> Do you remember that, Travis? Uh, I remember passing out. I remember waking up on the basketball court, but I don't remember the pass out. What did you do when you woke up? Did you go back to practice? I did eventually because we had to weigh out. Like, right. <laughs> So we had to weigh out of practice every day. And if you didn't lose five pounds in a practice, you went back in the wrestling room and ran. Jesus. You know? Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. That just, would not fly in America. Only yeah. in Germany could you pull some shit off. Well, like he's that. an army chaplain also. Right. Like he was in, you know, second armor division as the chaplain or whatever on yeah. the base, you know? Yeah. And he used to bring, he also ch- coached the, the base, you know, wrestling team back there before, before the war and all that shit. Like there was a lot of intramural sports on military bases and amongst units and stuff. And there's a base wrestling team and Cap Chaplin Kazi coached that team. Also, I kind of skipped over this part. Uh, Chaplin Kazi was the American heavyweight Olympian in 1980. Okay. So he was a no shit, like Olympian wrestler. He he wrestled in the Goodwill Games. He was a fucking. And 80s the year, I think that was it when we We boycotted boycotted the Olympics. He also won world championships in 1981. So he likely would have, would have, and he beat the guy that won gold from my understanding. So. Wow. He probably would have been. Yeah. Just, but, uh, just drug him out in the hallway. Yeah. But he also, he used to bring like soldiers from that team to help AI. Like they were assistant coaches, you know, uh, Mena. Yeah. George Mena. George Mena. Yeah. You know, he was one of them. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so I wrestled my senior year, I wrestled 130 pounds and, you know, I'm a high school senior. I weigh 130 pounds and we're wrestling like, you know, infantrymen from, from base. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I wrestled 103, but I was also a little fat kid. Yeah. So like if I had wrestled like at the weight I should have, I would probably wrestle at like 75 pounds. I was <laughs> yeah. Did you have any instances in, uh, in wrestling practice like your brother? No, I crushed it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was, of course you did. Yeah. 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 Man, uh, boot camp just had to be a fucking breeze for you guys. It didn't uh, seem easy. You know, for, for me, like boot camp, I was just homesick. That was it. Like, I loved doing all the shit. Like I was like, we get to wake up and go do a road march. That's so cool. (laughs) But I was also like, I miss my mom. (laughs) I agree with that. Yeah. It was, uh, yeah, just the the breakaway from like home was uh, a shock. But yeah, the physical side of it was like, meh, whatever. Yeah. We were both army brats too. So like kind of had a inkling of what's up, you know, like my dad was in Ranger Battalion. I hung out in the, my dad was a medic. So like back in the day, remember hanging out in the aid station, you know, and, uh, and, you know, just being around soldiers all the time. So it wasn't really that much of a shocker to, yeah. to go from civilian life to military life. We were like, yeah, I'm kind of sort of in military life. Yeah. Already. yeah. We had you like know? a super advantage in just bandwidth, you know, eating of the bandwidth. Like I knew how to wear a uniform. Like yeah. no one had to tell me that. Like I knew what to fucking do, like exactly how to wear it. Yeah. Whereas other guys were like, fuck, do I have to tuck what am I doing here? Is this go here where? Like, so I I think mentally and like bandwidth wise, we got to relax a little bit. Yeah. You know, which was which is nice. Logan, did you have any like exposure to mill guys, any to veterans growing up? No, not really. Uh, there, there was a little bit. Like I remember talking to a couple guys who were in around 
Vietnam and just afterward and, you know, kind of gave some words of wisdom, but it wasn't like a big part of my culture growing really? up. Yeah. I know what I wanted to ask you two guys. Watch. Here we go. So Travis, soda constructor, like SF or soda grad, soda constructor later too, right? No, I was never, I never instructed. I taught at Sephardic. I was actually not even an instructor. I was the NCYC there. Yeah. But uh, my last job in Marsoc, I was the, I guess, the long range fucking SME in our, so, in our training cell. I mean, not to mud suck here, Logan, on the Marines, but pretty much every Marine competition or sniper competition, I should say, is won by Army snipers. So why do you guys think that is? I think it's because there's a full-time shooting team for an Army, but <laughs> that's just me. I don't know about the international, the the international comp, but I know that like the USASOC sniper competition, Marsoc actually placed top 10, I think this year. They had a team from- uh, They're being too nice to each other. But, uh, <laughs> you know, there's there are organizations that take those things seriously and they dedicate time and resources to training. Right? Is it kind of like Best Ranger where like yeah. for years and years, like yeah. RTB, Ranger Training Brigade would win Best Ranger, but yeah. that's because they made it those guys' job to yeah. train They're for like that? SD doing it. You know and you, a lot of times at the USASOC comp, like the guys from the schoolhouse will do super good because they're instructors, right? Yeah. So they're literally teaching the skills that are required to do well in this course. And like, I was on a sniper team in, in SF and like the amount of things that you have to know to be on that team are like shooting is like, like that's cake, bro. We'll, we'll figure it out. Like, how do you program that radio? Like, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Like, how do you, how do you network all these radios together in this I th environment? Like, I think for know, there's all different those, things. I think for all those competitions, like use a sock, best sniper, scout sniper competition, best ranger, it should just be random. They should go, they should have a pool. Uh, yeah. Like they should go into the, like the personnel database and be like, all right, we're going to pick every third guy whose name starts with a P and then the, and just go down the line. And those guys from each unit are the ones who go there and compete for that unit's pride, right? Right. Guys who are actually doing the job at the time rather than guys who are like, yeah, I'm in the military to compete in a, in a little Right. Game. Like from my perspective, and you know, I'm not a subject matter expert in this, but it's kind of like you see the best ranger competitions, mm -hmm. right? And a lot of times, or you know, often it's won by like dudes who aren't in ranger battalion. Right. So like it's dudes who get to dedicate their whole entire existence right. towards this specific competition think skill set. Regiments won it like the last four or five times though. Yeah, they, they changed were, their whole approach though. Yeah. They have dudes like they they I think they have a regimental pool of dudes that are training and then the like whoever their coaches and stuff are, they they make teams. Well they'll do like, hey, you and you look good right. together, you're going together. Like, oh, I don't want to go, I want to go with my buddy. Like, nope, you're yeah. going with him when we win. started yeah. to win it. I worked at uh, I worked at Rip, so I like helped support the team. Mm -hmm. But yeah, there were tryouts at each battalion, and then those guys got special duty SD for like three months. Yeah, and they came down and they trained together. They did all the events like that was their job for three fucking months. But also, like you said, they would take they wouldn't be like if me and Logan were like let's do best ranger. We couldn't be partners. We would yeah. go there and then like the coach of the team would be like. No, you're better at this area and you're stuck in this area yeah. and they make these like perfect combos. Yeah. So yeah, we've, when I say we, like I'm not there anymore, but regiment has dominated Best yeah. Ranger for like the to last- To contrast that with, in 94, I trained for Best Ranger, intended to go do the competition. Uh, First Sergeant Lane came out of the company, came out of, you know, for formation was like, hey, Best Rangers in fucking two months or whatever. If anybody wants to be in Best Ranger, fucking let me know. And you guys can do PT on your own. Yeah, that was it. Yep. It was like, hey, if you wanted to be, yeah, you can do PT on your own. Like you didn't have to do fucking squad PT with your squad, you know, and that's it. And then my partner got a DUI, so I didn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> How big a deal is Best Ranger? In in the Ranger Regiment, it's a blip. Like, yeah. No one cares. Yeah. So, really? Yeah. Yeah. To guys on the line, they don't, I mean, it's like, oh, cool, man. But like in big army and stuff, is it like a pretty prestigious thing? I think, yeah, if you're, if you're in like the 82nd or, you know, RTB or the 101st, like that's just, that's a pretty prestigious thing. Yeah. Uh, but we, we made fun of the guys who did it. Yeah. Very yeah. often. Yeah. Well, you made fun of everybody. Yeah. But Even you're, your you know, you're like, <laughs> that's cool. You're off, you know. I mean, 
playing sports most, while I learn how to do your, my job. Yeah. Line units, I think, will make fun of like Best Ranger, make fun of them. You know, they also have like the Golden Knights and the Black Daggers and all this skydiving teams. Like any Halo team is going to make fun of those dudes. Like, yeah, whatever. Like, go skydiving. Right. Whatever, you know? Like, so that existence, understand that it needs to be like for recruiting or whatever, however they fit into the, into the matrix. I don't, you know, I don't know. But line guys generally frown on those dudes. In like a, in like a, like a negative way or just kind of like a joking, uh, ball busting way? In a ribbing, okay. justful way, you know? Yeah, because there was maybe a little bit of like sincerity to it. <laughs> yeah, I think it was like kind of across the board. It was like, you know, for the last 20 years, we've been at war. So it's like the best guys were kind of doing that job. That right. was, yeah, it was exactly. kind of the, the top priority. Do SEALs ever enter Best Ranger? No. How no would idea. they do? So the, the only, the only people, you can enter Best Ranger if you're Ranger qualified. Yeah. yeah. That you have to be yeah. Ranger qualified. Okay. You have to have completed Ranger school to enter it. Okay. Whereas like the international sniper competition is like okay. every swing and dick yeah. can go to that. Because there were some guys from like uh, 10th Mountain, I think this year that were like top 10. There was like one team. So you have to have a Ranger tab. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But I'll tell you what, I mean, as much, as much as I like to poke fun at our swim buddies, like they are physically gifted dudes. Really? I think they could probably win if they did it. Probably. Yeah. yeah. You know? Well, it's interesting because Jericho and I just finished up that that recon sniper boogie um, yeah, out, cool. out in Arizona, and so we we're catching up with a bunch of recon dudes. And the the army is really good at like career progression and allowing you, like, if you're in the special operations community, to like grow and progress and like have a really good career. And it's kind of a joke now because um, the certain Recon battalions are kind of just uh, a Q course pipeline. They're calling it because yeah. a lot the Marine Corps is having a hard time retaining some of yeah. their their top tier operators because they don't have that like same type of career progression over time. So, like for example, like a couple of guys in my platoon, like one went on to the Army Marksmanship Unit, and then one another one went to go to the Q course. So, like like not a lot of dudes stick around in the Marine Corps because they jump ship, go over to Army. Yeah, my brother's, I think four of my brother's teammates yeah. did that. Yeah. Got out, went like rep 62, rep 63 mm-hmm. through the guard into SF. Yes. You know, uh, and it's a little bit different now with Marsa yeah. coming on. Yeah, and stuff it like is. That. Yeah. But, you know, obviously. I think a lot of guys that are obviously that try out for Marsoc and make it and stuff. They probably, prior to that, they would have been going to the Q course. Yeah. yeah. It, yeah. But is, is that a, like, correct me if I'm wrong, but like the Marine Corps from what I've, the Scott about I've heard is like underfunded. Like, Make well, do with very little. You know, uh, I'm sure Travis can kind of comment uh, the current status a little bit better than I can, but <clears throat> it's, it just wasn't, it's it's new. It's like the baby program. Mm-hmm. Like it's just still in development as opposed to where some of these other programs have been around for decades longer. Okay. Yeah. And kind of the Marines that I've worked with that were like recon guys, they have like, it's, it's all, it's the same mentality as like Rangers used to have and me and Travis's like first touches on it is like, I don't need that. Like you, you make do with what you have, you know what I mean? Like that's, there's no, there's no like asking for more, you know what I mean? It's like, Hey, you got to go do this mission. And like, here's what you get. You're like, okay, I'm going to make it work. You know, just doing more with less. And that mentality permeates the entirety of the Marine Corps, Mm -hmm. right? Like where with us, that's just like in the soft community, that's Ranger centric. But you get to have these touches on other units. Like when we first started working with, you know, other tier units and they're like, they're like, whoa, what is that you're using? They're like, oh, it's this. I'm like, how'd you get that? Like, (laughs) I fucking asked for it. And you're like, oh, (laughs) you know, (laughs) whereas in, in the Marines, like in recon. And I think even in the inception or the early days of MARSOC, they still all had that Marine mentality of like, no, I can fight at night with iron sights. It's fine. Yeah. Like I'm a fucking Marine. I can make, get it done. And there's things like, yeah, you don't need it, yeah. but it makes life better. Yeah. And that, I see that, you know, from the Marine Corps side, like those guys still exist at higher levels. So when somebody presents them with like, Hey, here's X amount of money. They're like, we don't need that much. Yeah. Right. And you're like, whoa, whoa. If you're a line dog, you're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I need that much. And they're like, no, you don't bro. Move to the side. We can do it with less. Right. You know? And it's like, uh, especially in all of soft everybody's jockeying for position, you know? And if, if, if you can do it for a little less than the SEAL teams, then maybe we'll pick you. And if you can do it for less than Rangers, maybe we'll pick you. And it just goes around, you know? And all of those high echelon commands are like, you know, we're better for less. Was, was there ever a time in the GWAT when there was something for everyone to do? Like all the soft units and the different branches and stuff, like, or was it just a constant scrape 
to get in the fight. I mean, that depends what you, what you mean, you know, Go, get, getting over there and doing work. I mean, there were the bulk, well, the, the, the middle or bulk of my ranger career, there was too fucking much and it, okay. it, it, it ate our fucking lunch. So as far as the unit I was in, I mean, we were, we were the, like the surge years, you know, the, the winter strikes and uh, mm. team Merrill, team Darby were like, your dwell time was zero. Like you had. What does that mean, dwell time? Dwell time is the time you come home. Yeah, time between, between deployments. deployments. The, it, it, and it, that's when you started to see a lot of discipline issues, a lot of turnover. Um, and we had to kind of lower the standards a little bit and rip and rasp because of, you know, dudes were just burnt the fuck out. Mm -hmm. um, and in that time, you know, like we had, you know, a DUI in Ranger Battalion, that's cut and dry, you're out, you're done. Mm -hmm. And we were getting DUIs and be like, why are guys drinking? I'm like, because they don't fucking care. They're like, they don't want to quit, but they also don't care if they get kicked out. Yeah. Um, so you saw that going on. So for my seat, yeah, plenty of work, like too much work. Um, but I know in SF, they were like, just however you guys did your uh, horse blanket or whatever you mm -hmm. want to call it, like the deployment chart, like some guys or teams or groups would just get like, just due to the shuffle, like miss out. Yeah. In SF, every, every group is theater oriented, you know? So obviously if the war's happening in the Middle East, you know, first group in Asia, you know, they're like not a lot to do. It's weird too. Cause like, right. Just prior to, I think it was in 2000, the AOs kind of got shuffled, you know, and, uh, all the stands at one time were considered part of Asia in the soft world. And so like first group lost all those to the Middle East and literally like the next year is when 9-11 happened. I know a lot of first group, I was in first group at the time. A lot of first group dudes were like, what the fuck? Like we just deployed to Mongolia, like last year, like what, you know, what's going on? And, uh, you know, so it, that changed things. And, uh, you know, it's, if you're looking from a, you know, from a global standpoint, like, is there something to do for everyone? Of course, like it's, cause I'm not thinking about Afghanistan or Iraq. Like there's, there's tons to do everywhere all yeah, the time. North you know? Africa and stuff like that. I mean, that. we're just finding out about, you know, not just, but recently, you know, a lot of things that happened in South America around Iran Contra and seventh group, you know, working down there in the eighties, like that stuff comes out, you know, but yeah, that was, that was uh, way prior to like social media and stuff, you yeah. know? And, uh, you know, it's interesting about the you internet, mentioned, you mentioned information, you mentioned Iran Contra and Ali North where they were running those, those arms through Costa Rica and Nicaragua. Mm -hmm. Uh, when the Ali North trial was going on, there was a newscaster broadcast and she's doing a broadcast from where they're smuggling in these weapons, these mm -hmm. arms. <clears throat> and there was this massive, massive cobblestone point break, like one of the most dynamic waves in all of Central America. <laughs> and a couple surfers saw it. And it's now known as Ali's Point. The only way you can get there is by boat. And it is nice. one of the gnarliest right here. It's so amazing, <laughs> but it's hilarious. It's like saying, so, you know, there's a positive that yeah. came out of that whole shit storm. Yeah. <laughs> it is funny when I, we think back, like uh, when we lived here in San Antonio, our dad was a, an instructor at the SF Medic Course. After he left, he went to the SF Medic Course as a Ranger Medic. Didn't ever go to the Q course, but because he, he was the honor grad of the course, yeah. they let him be an instructor. And also they thought it would be good to have a ranger there because rangers came through. Uh, but anyway, when he was working there, when we lived here, he would go down to Honduras and Nicaragua and yeah. all that shit all the time for long, like months. Yeah. And he would say they were doing training shit, but like, I don't, I don't know what the fuck he was doing, yeah. you know, like probably some, some support, med support, support level shit. Whatever the hell yeah. was going on. But there was like, yeah, lots of cool stuff when, when Ronnie Reagan was in charge. Like yeah. We were getting after it all over. Indeed. I recently was crushed because uh, at one one of these deployments, he, he'd he always bring you back something. You know, dad goes down range, he brings back some gifts or whatever. One year he brought back these parakeets, these birds. Yeah. Supposedly they were from, you know, from South America somewhere. I only recently found out that he bought them at like fucking Pet Mart, like down the road from the are house. Are you serious? <laughs> yeah. Oh That's man. I'm like, what? Are you serious? I was going to say like <laughs> traveling with birds. But yeah. I remember. I, was, yeah. I had questions. <laughs> I remember. But I mean, I was like, you know what, 11 years old or something like at the time. My bird's name was Panama Pete. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Cause he said he got him in Panama. Yeah. That's bullshit. Yeah. Trust, why would you, why trust would you, issues. Why would right. you burn that? Why would you burn that secret? Like that's, that's an awesome story. Because my dad, I was hurt by it. <laughs> my ranger, no, I'm talking about your dad. Like yeah. it's like my, my, you know, my you know, secret ranger, mm -hmm. Central American daddy smuggled parrots back to us. No son, we got those at Petsmart. Well, he probably did it back then. For, it was like a 20 year joke. He, yeah. he just wanted to talk. It's like, oh, this yeah. is going to be funny in 20 yeah, years. Be like, damn it, you found out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Shit. I just, I'm just finding this out. Does it bother yeah. you? A little. 
Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> you should. Bit. I thought I was like I really proud same. of him. I was like, yeah, I got this bird. He's from Panama. He made a liar out of me to a lot of people, you know, in my like kindergarten class. Y'all never asked like how he got him here? Yeah. Yeah. No, I remember him no. saying he carried the the, yeah. the cage through the plane. Oh, like shit. had it on the plane. On, I was like, oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Panama Pete. I already came home from school one day and Panama Pete had uh, fallen off his little perch and broke his neck and died. It's the first yeah. thing I so ever like saw. So like Dumb and Dumber Petey? His head yeah. fell off. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, all right. right. This yeah. is great. Yeah. <laughs> well, thanks for uh, allowing us a trip down memory lane. Yeah. Indeed. Good stuff. Denman's. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Travis, how can people find you uh, on, the, on the socials? I'm Coach Whiskers on, uh, on the socials. Coach underscore Whiskers right on, on Instagram. I just got a Twitter only because of the Elon stuff. And there I you go. Really, I don't really know how to work it. But uh, it's accessible. Have, it is accessible. Have Coach Whiskers on Twitter also and uh, the Instagrams. Right on. Check them out and uh, toodles. Bye.